Hello, Bill. Good morning, Matt. Welcome to the DMZ, everyone. Super Bowl Sunday edition. That's right. Coming off the, uh, we're not allowed to say Super Bowl on this show, uh, so we'll call it the big game. <laughs> uh, the big game is coming up Sunday. Is this, is this a little bit sad and, for you? Uh, I, I know you get excited at the beginning of football season. You know, I, I'm, an, I'm an Aussie rules man, so I'm not as focused on the, on the American sport. But uh, after this, you, get your, you, you have months with no football. It doesn't that, uh, isn't it a bittersweet day? Yeah, it's a little like Christmas, you know, mm-hmm. uh, a little like Christmas morning, you know, the, the sort of law, the, the depression that can set in after the big thing. I do think, though, that, uh, you know, when the NFL put in the two weeks between the playoffs and the Super Bowl, they sort of get you warmed up for that. Last weekend, I guess the Pro Bowl happened, which I didn't watch. And I don't think, well, actually, I think the ratings are good, but I have no idea why anybody would watch the Pro Bowl. But Essentially, last weekend I was without football, so uh, it's all I'm already there, um, and so it's you know it's just one of those things, man. It's a depressing time of year. It's it's this is not this is not my favorite time of year. Football's over. It's cold. Uh, pitchers and catchers have not yet reported. Um, it, it is uh, there. There are certain seasons that I love. You know, I, I'll tell you that in October. When, you know, when, when you've got football starting and you've got the baseball playoffs and the World Series and it's still night, it's still go outside in the sun and it's, it's not too hot, it's not too cold. I mean, there are seasons I like. I think that right now we're entering into, you know, probably the worst part of, uh, of the year. You, you, but the time between Super Bowl and pitchers and catchers reporting is uh, maple sap, maple, maple syrup season, sugar shack season. So, you know, if you got to fill that gap. He's got to come up to Western Mass, get some fresh syrup. You know, it'll all be good. I really feel like I need to um, have things like that in my life, that, <laughs> you know, traditions and, and rituals. And I need to find, you know, I, I think I need to get some hobbies. And maybe Sugar Shack, <laughs> Sugar Shack season could be that for me. I could become, like, obsessed, like, known for that. You know, yeah, sh- so. Sugar Shack road trip. So, and, you know, well, we're on the way to New Hampshire. Uh, there's there's a lot of New Hampshire stumping going on these days, so you you can you can you can make it a work trip. You can expense it. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a perfectly legitimate uh, expenditure, no <laughs> doubt about that. It's not even close. But but back back to Super Bowl. I, I, the, you know, football is what's what's most important right now. Are you going to support the cheaters of New England, or are you going to support the people who play football by the rules, known as the Seahawks? Well, I think they all cheat. So I, I think this is this is like Watergate for this deflate gate is like Watergate for for so many reasons. And I think part of it is that, yes, I think they cheated at, by deflating the balls. Um, but I think they see it as everyone does it. And I, I suspect everyone probably does do it and uh, that it's more mischievous than it is um, scurrilous. Uh, so anyway, so that, I'll be that for, doesn't ruin the whole game. That the entire thing is a farce. Everyone's a bunch of cheaters. We have no heroes. Uh, there's no there, there's no role models here. This is all just bad lessons being imparted on society. This is this doesn't uh, shake your foundations. Well, first, I think the NFL should control the balls. Uh, you know, they've got this thing where each team essentially, you know, manages their own footballs. There's no chain of custody. You know, the referees inspect them to make sure they're within a certain you know, inflation, whatever. Uh, and, and then, then, so I, I think the NFL should be just controlling the footballs. Um, ha- no, having no, said, baseball, they let the teams build their own parks and make up their own right. lengths of the field. Well, I mean, I look as a, as a sort of traditionalist, I actually think that that makes baseball interesting. And, and that's, 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 you know, I, I like the fact that each park has its own dimensions and a home run and Camden Yards might be, you know, a fly ball and Yankee Stadium or whatever, you know, I mean, um, and, and you can build a team around your park, you know, a team, if it's a big park, you have speed, it's a small park, you go for power or whatever. Uh, I, I kind of like that. And I don't, I don't see that as cheating. But I guess you do raise an interesting point, which is to say, like one man's cheating is another man's uh, just taking, you know, 
an advantage, you know, trying to, to put your best foot forward. So, look, I do think that it makes it harder for me to root for either. I, I think neither of these teams are really likable. Um, both coaches are utterly unlikable. Um, you've got uh, people like Richard Sherman, who is on the Seahawks, who just is the biggest trash talker in the game. I, I really, you know, can't see rooting for the Seahawks. And so I'll be rooting for for Brady and the Patriots, but I do it a little more reluctantly than I would have otherwise. And, and I think it's for me, because I think the thing is, maybe everybody cheats. Aren't they the biggest cheaters? They seem to be the, uh, or maybe they're the worst cheaters because they keep getting caught all the time. <laughs> There's something about it that would suggest that perhaps uh, they're not uh, uh, the team of dynasty that they would like to be perceived. Well, look, you've got the Spygate controversy. Um, and somebody, I forget who, but somebody put out an interesting uh, sort of uh, explainer showing that, that, that the Patriots fumble far less than any other team. And to me, that was a really interesting statistic because everybody assumed that the reason you deflate a ball would be that it makes it easier for Brady to pass it and easier to catch it. But I guess it also would make it harder to have a football stripped from you um, or to fumble a football. And so, you know, it's possible that the Patriots have been getting away with this for years and that that the real advantage they've had is, is fewer fumbles. Now, other people disagree. They say that Belichick won't permit fumble if you fumble your, your cut. Um, and so there's an argument that the Patriots have just essentially made a priority of not fumbling. But the numbers seem really ridiculous. Um, so, look, I, I think it I, – for me, now I, I think that – this is probably good for ratings, like the deflate gate. Everybody can comprehend it. You can understand it. And you might be rooting for the Patriots to lose because they're cheaters. So I think that in terms of ratings, this, this like arguably helps. For me, I'm going to watch the game either way, but it does taint the game a little bit. Like I will enjoy it a little bit. Like For me, there's no obvious good guy that I'm going to be able to root for. So it takes some of the fun away as far as I'm concerned. Uh, it's sad to hear, but hopefully you can, you can extract some, uh, um, uh, American patriotism out of, uh, Sunday regardless. Um, but we have a, another matchup is brewing, uh, in their Republican primary. So even in the, even in the sports lull season, you have, uh, you had the freedom summit, uh, in Iowa this past weekend, you, uh, and, and, you know, people may not know this about you, but you have been a longstanding, uh, Sarah Palin defender saying that she's gotten a bad rap, that she has more substance than people have given credit for. People have overlooked her, her gubernatorial record. Uh, you edited a book of her, of, her, uh, of her speeches a few years back called The Quotable Rogue. But uh, it seems yeah, like... Yeah, uh, <clears throat> I'm going to move out of the way. There's, there's like still... Behind, I keep this here just because I have a poster of it behind me just because um, I need like some something in the background that's not just a, a blank white wall and... <laughs> I haven't gotten around to putting a cool bookshelf or something behind me. So go buy that book. <laughs> while, while, while they're still on the, on the shelves. Um, because I, I, it appears that maybe Sarah, if South Pan's coming back, right? If she's, a, if she's back in the mix, you know, your book may, that book would be relevant again, right? I mean, everyone's going to want to hear about the, the intellectual depth that is Sarah Palin. Well, I have a lot to say about this. Um, so, you know, I wrote a piece for the Daily Beast that really kind of blew up um, where I um, where, where I was trying to be introspective and, and deal with my complicated relationship with with Palin. I mean, I don't know Palin, but as as a commentator about Palin, um, I would say a couple things. So. So since. Since the 2008 presidential race ended, I've been, I think, intellectually honest in terms of how I've approached Palin. Like, I have defended her and praised her when I thought she was right. But I've also been critical of her. So I don't want to give the impression. I think some people, uh, there were a lot of, you know, stories about this written. And it was like, long time Palin defender Matt Lewis finally backs away from her. And I don't think that's exactly true either. So you, I would say you, you've had a gradual uh, uh, decoupling, let's say. No, I would say actually, since she 
quit her job as governor, I started like to me that was a defining moment. And and from that from that minute forward, I had been critical of her when I thought she was wrong and and still found time to praise her when I thought she was right. So like I, I don't have Palin derangement syndrome. I don't like inherently dislike Palin. Um, but the, the notion that I've been like carrying her water for five or six or whatever years, that's not true. Now, what is true is that in 2008, I was one of the first among a small group of people who were sort of pushing her as the running mate. So I was, I wasn't pushing her specifically, but I was saying like, she is one of a handful of people that McCain should seriously consider picking. Like this is long before anybody knew who she was. So the, the, and, this, so the fact that she has been uh, uh, thrust upon our culture for the last six years, it's your fault. We have you to blame that we still have to look at her <laughs> in our, in our, in our, in our boxes uh, over and over and over again. Is that, is that fair to say? Well, Partly to blame, and but really the other the other thing that I that I sort of wanted to re-examine because as you know, Bill, in recent in the last week, um, a lot of conservative writers and opinion leaders have turned against her, and and I guess it started with Byron York at the Washington Examiner who wrote about this long rambling and pointless speech that she gave. I mean, again, she's pretending that she's running for president yet again. So it's just a charade. And I think she's finally sort of, and it's not just the sort of center right journalist, but it's also Eddie Scary over at the Examiner talked to a bunch of conservative bloggers who had, who had been, you know, staunch defenders of her. They're, they're abandoning her. So this caused me to sort of do some reflection because my theory had been that, um, my, th- I'd been operating under this premise that, um, that Palin, that I, that I was right, that Palin was a great pick. Um, and that what happened is she got thrown in the deep end. I think that, I still think she was mishandled by the McCain campaign. Um, I think that there were some really vicious attacks lodged against her, especially the trig truther stuff. And I think that that sort of embittered her and radicalized her. And um, and then I think that once Obama got elected and the rise of the Tea Party, Palin, rather than boning up on the issues, becoming, you know, America's Thatcher, she cashed in and became a rally star. So my my premise for a long, long time had been that. Now, what I did, though, in 2008 that I was starting to feel a little bit bad about is um, I wrote several pieces that were pretty aggressively attacking people like Kathleen Parker, Peggy Noonan, and others who, during the campaign, were voicing criticism of Palin. Um, and I actually argued that that they helped turn her into what she became. Um, and I felt like their attacks on her were premature. Uh, I think there's a part of me that I had drank the Kool-Aid a little bit. And I, and I really felt like, and I was more, I was probably more of a quote team player back then than I am now. Um, I think I felt like, look, this is who McCain picked and you're essentially aiding and abetting Barack Obama by publicly criticizing her. And really what this piece was about was looking back and saying like, maybe Kathleen Parker actually saw something that I did. Like maybe she saw what Palin was going to become. Maybe she was right in, in hindsight. Maybe she was right. Maybe maybe Kathleen Parker saw something, saw a character flaw that I didn't see. And um, and there were a lot of conservative journalists who I personally you know, attacked on my blog and who came under some pretty harsh scrutiny for being critical of Sarah Palin. And again, this is 2008. It's like September, October of 2008 I'm talking about. I'm not talking about 2010 or 2011 or whatever. But in any event, um, that's what the piece is about. But let me ask you, Bill. So there are two theories, okay? The theory that I had been operating on for a long, long time was 
that that Palin um, that they strangled the conservative baby in the crib. That she was this talented person, and that by being thrown in the deep end, by being viciously attacked, she became radicalized. But now I'm starting to entertain this other theory that says, well, actually, people like Kathleen Parker saw something in her that I didn't see that I've since that has since manifested itself. What's your take? Well, I think, I mean, on one hand, I, I, I never, you know, I, I wrote a uh, critical piece of her um, 2008 convention speech at the time uh, saying that it was, uh, you know, essentially, you know, uh, you know, too, uh, too superficial to be taken seriously as a, uh, as presidential timber and that, and that it would eventually hurt her in the, in the campaign. Uh, and I remember my, my one of my bosses uh, said to me that he he thought I was being too uh, wishful thinking in my analysis that 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 she w- was going to tap us on that that's more more populous in the country. But I, I I think I was correct at the time that after eight years of Bush, after eight years of people thinking, hey, we we tr- we tried the kind of anti intellectual <laughs> approach, the the dismissive dismissives of, of of the eggheads and just good old fashioned. Uh, uh, common sense uh, uh, attitude uh, as that, that all sort of crumble around us that there was a hunger for something that was a bit more sophisticated uh, in our presidential politics uh, and uh, and I think that and, and it, I, so I, I think Palin was never uh, someone who was capable of of meeting that standard but I also think that she has uh, fallen farther from where she was in 2008, where she's become just total caricature. She just sort of walked into the critique of her from both the left and the Kathleen Parker right and felt that she would somehow beat it by, you know, turning into the skid and just owning it. And, and she just becomes more of just sort of this, you know, you uh, kind of like short circuited, Right wing Fox News pundit automatron <laughs> spitting out random, you know, uh, uh, hate sound bites and thinking that's going to uh, excite the crowd and keep her on TV. Uh, and I think this the speech uh, this past weekend was 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 such a disjointed mess that you know everybody sees it. And I'm aware on the on the on the political spectrum. It's, well, it's, it's impossible. Let to me let me say it. this though, Bill. I, I, I also think. That, you know, she spoke two years ago at CPAC where she had the big gulp. And I mean, that was a ridiculous speech, too. Yeah. It's interesting to me that <clears throat> that I've, you know, we've, we've I've, I've, I've argued this before, but it does seem like there's finally reached a tipping point where it's safe to criticize Palin from the right. Like it didn't used to be. And now I think that it's actually like. It's actually now de rigueur, essentially, uh, or or however that French word is pronounced. I mean, it's it, it's it's de rigueur, uh, whatever it is. Um, I think it's now actually almost the norm if you're a conservative, and it used to be apostasy to do it. Um, and but it, but, it, but is this just about Palin because Palin has become so uh, ridiculous, or uh, and, you know, and I, I know this is a book that you're working on, the, your book Too Dumb to Fail, saying the Republicans yeah, yeah. have to stop you know, going into the anti-intellectual gutter. You know, does this speak to a, a broader awakening on the right saying, look, th- this kind of approach to politics is a loser. Uh, we can't keep trying to, to, to elevate the, the people who are, who are trying to be dumb uh, and think that is somehow going to uh, strike a chord with, uh, with with the American rabble that we we need to start elevating people who are trying to elevate our discourse. Uh, right. I mean, you, I mean, I, I thought it was notable that the buzz coming out of Iowa was not Ben Carson, was not Mike Huckabee, was not Ted Cruz. It was Scott Walker. And I don't think Scott Walker's speech was somehow uh, you know a, a, a tour de force of intellectualism, but relatively speaking. <laughs> It was, you know, a whole lot better than what some of the other folks were doing. He at least was coming in. I mean, maybe if you didn't see it, I mean, the, the speech basically was, look at my record as governor. I have been a very conservative governor in a very blue state, 
and I, I've been big and bold, and I and I've won three times in four years. Therefore, yeah. you, I have well, some problem, evidence that I could the win. The problem on is the if, if only, state. if only walk, if only you could, you could take, you could bump plans, as Rick Perry said. I mean, <laughs> if you had someone, someone with the charisma of a Palin, and the accomplishments and seriousness of Scott Walker, who, by the way, not even a college graduate. So this isn't an elite this argument. Um, but at least but it was, Scott, but at least it was someone saying, judge us by what we've done, not yeah. by our sound bites. And right, but, people but, seem but to have some a, appetite for that. It's ironic that there does seem to be a, a, a an inverse relationship between the candidates who are exciting and charismatic and the candidates who are thoughtful and experienced and, and it's really ridiculous but if I, I feel like it's a this has been going on, going on for a long time to find a candidate who embodies who's like charismatic and exciting enough because you have to be a rock star to be president nowadays i believe but also serious thoughtful experienced enough and and we we've got people in both camps um I don't, I don't think Scott Walker has the rock. St- I think you have to be a rock star to make it as a president now. He's 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 got enough to be senator. He's got enough to be governor, but president. You know, for me, I think you know uh, Cruz, Christie, and Rubio are the three that I think have the kind of star power that it would take um, for what that's worth. That's but, do you, but, but do you think it's on the right in general, are you seeing a turn away from from the Palin approach, from from the Huckabee yeah. approach, uh, uh, from the Ben Carson approach, saying you know the uh, it's, it's, and saying the this kind of 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 Fox News soundbite politics is not the ticket to the White House. Well, I mean, I, I think that. Those candidates are always going to appeal to, they're always going to have an audience in the, the grassroots. But I think the fever has broken. And Bill, you know, I, um, you know, I'm writing this book. It's called Too Dumb to Fail. Uh, it's with Hachette. You, you are helping me edit it as we speak. Uh, I, I, mean, literally I, I, right I will now. share in the blame when it becomes a bestseller <laughs> and transforms the Republican Party. Well, there are plenty of there are plenty of you know conservatives and that are that are helping me as well who are giving me input, but but uh, but you are helping, uh, which which is greatly appreciated. Um, so now the fear is that the book will not be greeted as um, constructive criticism, as, as you know, like my goal is not to bash Republicans or conservatives. It's to argue that conservatism was a proud intellectual philosophy. It has been dumbed down in some ways that are patently unconservative. And I believe we have a bright future ahead. We can have a conservative renaissance. So that's the the sort of premise, right? So yesterday, as I mentioned, I wrote this piece about Palin. And it was a little test case because I wanted to see how would this do. And I have to say, now, there were liberals who were, like, praising it. You know, liberals like to, you know, this. there's a trope that I think is true, that, like, if you're a conservative who criticizes a Republican, then you are seen as having grown and become thoughtful. And that stuff happened, and that doesn't, like, trust me, I'm not going to, like, fall for that. I mean, good. I hope liberals buy the book. I hope they love what I write. But my goal is really to sort of help save the conservative movement and and restore it to, I think it's proud tradition. But what, what actually really made me feel good, Bill, were how many conservatives, some of the same people who I think would have attacked me two or three years earlier for writing that were saying, yes, finally somebody said it, you know, like I'm with you. You know, she's been a joke for a long time, stuff like that, Mm -hmm. that, I, that leads me to believe that I think that, that the timing is starting to get right, that that, they're, that conservatives are more receptive to this message, that they have seen some of the damage that has been done by candidates who are exploiting the base, um, by 
outside groups and PACs that are essentially hucksters who are, um, you know, exploiting the base. And, um, and, and so I think that I feel pretty good that the timing of this is going to be going to be that it's going to be well received, that people are starting to get this message. It's not about betraying conservative values. I do not want to do that. I mean, there are some issues where I don't have, you know, an orthodox conservative position, but like, I'm not saying give up the pro-life flag because (laughs) I wouldn't want to be a part of that movement. I mean, I'm hardcore pro-life. I'm not saying let's raise taxes. So this isn't like someone saying, well, we need to be popular and the way to do that is to become liberals. No, that's not my message. It's that, you know, smart conservatism, uh, going back to Reagan, Buckley, Burke, uh, is the way to go. And that in recent years, we have essentially bought into a, a dumbed down populist in the bad way. You know, there's a good populism and bad populism, and that sort of a bad populism that preaches victimization and bitterness and all that, that stuff. Um, so I'm kind of hardened right now, Bill. Now, is this um, uh, nascent trend of, uh, of interest in Republican intellectualism, conservative intellectualism, uh, will that extend to the candidacy of Jeb Bush? Now, he, he was not at the Iowa Freedom Summit, which was hosted by Representative Steve King, so you had a lot of, you know, uh, reaching out to the, 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 the social conservative and anti-immigration uh, conservative base in Iowa. Jeb Bush was in San Francisco uh, at a paid, uh, paid speaking gig to the National Association of Automobile Dealers. Uh, and, but it was, and, and while he said this is not a political speech, it's not a stump, you know, but it clearly was what, what was a, a uh, early stump speech laying out his, his outlines of a, of a policy agenda. Uh, and so on one hand, and I wrote about this over at the Campaign for America's Future blog at ourfuture.org, uh, you know, on one hand, his presentation is very uh, sober and serious and competent. And, uh, he's ta- he has a lot of facts and figures. He's uh, talking about the need for compromise. He's willing to break from uh, conservative orthodoxy on immigration, on education, and, and, and is brave enough to take those sort of stances. Uh, but... I was more critical of the speech because I thought it had its own brand of incoherence, you know, wasn't this a Sarah Palin style incoherence, but as Jeb is sort of trying to give an honest uh, critique of the economy and talk about the, the, the income gap and paychecks aren't rising and, and whatnot, he can't separate uh, what the, and, 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 he's, and he's offering some honesty as far as the good stuff's happening in the economy, but he can't do the same and give any credit to Obama for the good parts as, 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 while critiquing the bad. Uh, you know, for example, he says, uh, far from spreading opportunity, our government now gets in the way each and every day. Another law, another tax, another fee, another regulation. It all stands in the way of a new business, um, dot, dot, dot. The great stories that were told here today of successful dealerships, it's harder to do exactly what you all have done to achieve earned success. So he he has to acknowledge he's talking to a room of auto dealers who are doing well. I mean, the the, the data from the the NADA themselves talks about they've had much higher sales, for example, in 2014 and 2013. He, He can't square that with what he wants to say about government being in the way of business success. So he, he can't give a nuanced, uh, a proper nuanced approach. Uh, he starts saying how we need the, uh, the economy to grow at 35 to 4% and not have this new normal of 1.5 to 2%. But the last two quarters have been 4.6 and 5%. Uh, so he can't, I mean, and he, he gives sort of a nod to that, but he, but he, then he still reverts to the critique as if the last six months did, didn't happen. Um, so I, I still think he has a problem, it, it, and it's a problem for Republicans in general. I mean, there's obviously stuff to say about the parts of the economy that are not doing well. Democrats talk about that too, but Democrats are, are more able to say, we've done these good things over the past six years, now let's work on these things that haven't, um, that, 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 are, that are still problems. Republicans still want to say everything's bad, 
and they can't set, figure out that you know what something something's worked out okay. Uh, you know, this also happened with uh, an event at the at the Koch Brothers Freedom Partners event that ABC um, Jonathan Carl did an interview with uh, Marco Rubio and Ted Cruz and Rand Paul, the three senators who might run for president. Carl was repeatedly saying, you know, you said we're going to be on a path to ruin under Obama, and things aren't at least they're not a path to ruin right now. You might think there are certain things that are bad, but stock market's up, growth is up, unemployment's down. We're not on a path to ruin. Uh, and they couldn't accept that. They still had to find a way to pivot to say every, everything was awful. Uh, so I think there, there's, there's an incoherence in the economic critique, even when they're trying to sound more intelligent, that they're still falling short. Well, you know, there's a lot, a lot of things I could say here, but the one thing I'll say is I think there's a danger of fighting the last war. And I think Republicans are, are in, in danger of that. I mean, the, the way to... The way that you've been able to have success at, as a Republican internally it has been to attack Obama. And in fact, I think that Ted Cruz in Iowa, basically, that his pitch is you should nominate the person who's been attacking Obama the most consistently, the most vigorously. Like that, that should be the litmus test, which, of course, is the definition of fighting the last war. Um, and so I, I think that, you know, I could get into, we could talk about income inequality. We could talk about the, about the economy. Um, we could talk about, you know, rhetoric. Should we be talking about the 47%? Should we be talking about the middle class or whatever? But really, I think like a, a sort of a bigger problem that Republicans need to grapple with is that I think that they are, um, still obsessed with Obama that that um, a certain percentage of the base is still turned on by you know a sort of sort of clamoring for rhetoric that attacks Obama, but Barack Obama is not on the ballot this time, and um, really I think what Republicans and conservatives need to focus on is the future and crafting an actual proactive vision, and it could contrast with what Democrats and liberals are doing, but it shouldn't be 99% focused on what they're doing. So to me, I think that's a big problem. And I think as, um, as this Republican primary plays out, it's almost like they're running against Barack Obama, like it's a midterm uh, or, or like it's a reelection. And it's not. It's not going to be about Barack Obama. Um, and I think that's that's sort of a that's that's a phenomenon I've noticed. It, it feels like they're still running against Obama. And maybe that's not unprecedented. Maybe it's so early that it, it doesn't matter that much. But it, it does worry me that, that they're like obsessed with this guy and that they could end up fighting the last war. Why don't we shift away from uh, 2016? Because there was some big news in in the in the new media world uh, with. Uh, uh, Andrew Sullivan uh, announcing that he was not going to blog anymore, uh, and this is only two years after he he took his his Daily Dish site. I think it was most recently with was what was was Newsweek where he was at most recently. I I, I have heard him keeping sure he was at the, the Daily Atlantic. Beast. The Daily Beast was the last place. Okay, which was part he of was. Newsweek. Uh, had been had been news. Uh, but he said he was going to be his own operator. He was going to have subscriptions. He was going to show this was a self-sustaining proposition. Um, he made a big deal about moving away from New York into Washington, D.C. Uh, and uh, it, it seems to me, and I, and I think Pelico's Dylan Byer seemed to allude to this too, uh, it, it wasn't really working out. I mean, I think he was, I think he was making some money. I don't, he, I don't think he was going broke. Uh, but... He wasn't really being influential in the discourse the way he was when he was backed by a larger media property. Um, you know, it's uh, it's somewhat analogous to uh, to Glenn Beck, you know, leaving Fox, and having his own having his own Blaze Empire. I think the Blaze is probably more successful than what Sullivan was doing by by himself because the Blaze has a whole bunch of you know it has it has space on cable TV and you know, syndicate radio program and, and, and whatnot. Uh, but it still sort of lives in its own universe. It doesn't necessarily seem to bleed right. out into the broader well, Howard discourse. Stern, another example would be Howard Stern. Yes. I mean, I'm sure he, 
he probably makes more money on satellite radio, but I think he was probably more relevant to the culture when he was on terrestrial radio. Right, and uh, and I mean, and, and you know, Howard had had a fat paycheck from Sirius XM that it's, 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 she sustains that operation, whether it gets ratings or not. Uh, it was a very, it was a very long-term, long-term contract because he essentially props up that entire subscriber base, you know, uh, where, uh, uh, you know, Andrew Sullivan a, was a, just a Andrew pole. Sullivan. Yeah. yeah. Tempo. Uh, so uh, you know, I wondered, you know, he, he, he spun it as, you know, I want to, you know, sort of unplug and I want to read more and I want to enjoy l- the real world and, kind of tossed out there, I want to write a book, which just maybe already has a book deal in his back pocket that he needs to work on. Uh, uh, but it, it, I, it struck me as being more a implicit admission of failure that totally going it alone, uh, you know, is probably not sustainable if you want to be at the level of influence that he was at before. Well, okay, so I, I took, I, I took him... At, at face value, that that what he was saying is true. And look, I mean, people who <laughs> it's it's hard to complain and bitch about getting paid to blog and being getting paid to write. But you know, there's this story. Uh, Tony Kornheiser, people come up to him and they ask. They say, you know, I think I could do a daily. I could do a radio show. I could do a sports radio show. And he says, you know, I bet you could. Yeah, I bet you could come in on Monday after after a a football Sunday, and you could have a pretty good show. You might even do better than me. And I bet you could come in on Tuesday, and you could probably have a pretty good show. But what's your Thursday show going to be? Because by then the adren- adrenaline is worn off. And what do you, you know? What are you going to talk about then? How's your Thursday show going to be? And so, I, I think there's there's a uh, a connection here. I mean, you try for 15 years being putting up, you know, 10 to 15 blog posts a day, even if you're just curating stuff, you still have to know enough to know what to curate. And he was brilliant at it. Um, it's, you're essentially tethered to the blog and it becomes very difficult to be weighing in on everything that happens multiple times a day and still be kind of um, replenishing your soul, reading interviewing people, talking to people, taking vacations. Sullivan managed to do some of that stuff, of course, but it's difficult. Um, I, I, think, I think it's what New York Magazine pointed out that he did quit blogging 10 years ago. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, this is he, not the first time. Uh, he's found ways to you know, take a step back and work on bigger projects and come back in, and, by, and, and, all, and it's very possible he'll do the same thing again here. Um, you know, very much like, uh, you know, a musician, you know, retiring. Yeah. Only to have a big comeback, you know, uh, later on. And he has people, I mean, he has lots of people, you know, unlike me, for example, we had lots of people who help him, who, who like interns and, and guest staff. bloggers. Yeah, he, had, he, had, he had a 10 person staff. Yeah. And I think that's part of his deal when he went to like some of these outlets that they would, you know, people like Connor Friedersdorf, who's here at the, uh, blogging heads, I think for a while worked for him in that capacity or, you know, so look, I, I think that this is something that bloggers struggle with. So I think there's a bigger story here. You know, Newt Gingrich tells this parable about um, uh, field field mice and antelope. And he says, um, you know, a lion could theoretically survive by chasing, catching, killing, and eating field mice, but he would also eventually starve to death. Um what a lion needs to do is catch some antelope and it's harder and it takes more time, but that's what will nourish a lion. And I think that, you know, in this analogy, you know, a lot of writers and bloggers are chasing field mice, these little stories of the day that are timely, that give you that little buzz, that little like sugar rush of, well, I just wrote something. I just tweeted it, but it's not the same as reading a long book or writing a book that might have some permanence and some long-term importance. And I think, you know, Chris Saliza, the fix, um, wrote a good piece about this where he talks about how, you know, the problem essentially is that Andrew Sullivan had so much success as a blogger that he never evolved his style of blogging. Like, like for example, when I started blogging, it was before Twitter. So, the expectation was if I was going to build an audience, 
people were, I had to get people in the habit of coming to my blog. And to do that, I had to be producing a lot of content to keep them coming. That was the model. Well, I don't, I have no expectation that anybody will go read my blog today. My expectation is that I will drive them there via Twitter, which means that if I don't blog today, I don't feel guilty. I don't feel as guilty that I'm letting my readers down because they're coming to my blog expecting fresh content um, because I don't see that happening. Uh, I, I, I think it's, it's contingent on a distribution mechanism like Twitter or other, other things to drive people there. When I have something to write, I write it and I drive them to my blog. Sullivan never adapted to that model, probably because he was so good at the original model. And I think Saliza, reading between the lines, I think he's essentially arguing that that, that leads to the burnout, that, that whereas people like Saliza and I um, adapted and changed the way that we blog, Sullivan was still wedded to the model that demanded constant content. Well, I, I mean, it, it, you you never know. I mean, I, I I suspect that if he had stayed with the Atlantic, for example, or stayed with the Daily Beast, and uh, it, you probably may, may more so the Atlantic as the Daily Beast has had, uh, you know, it had, you know, it was a it was a different place when he was partnered with, with Newsweek and had had a bit more reach. Although I think it's sort of it, it is managing its transition away from that fairly well. Uh, but I think the Atlantic probably was probably a bigger platform for him. Uh, I, I would I would suspect that he could have been still doing what he was doing, you know, because he because some of his longer form thoughts would have more uh, would have more of a push from that from that media backing, you know, you you'd, you'd be in the print publication from time to time. You have a PR department pushing your stuff out. Uh, there's a certain cachet that comes with that that sort of attracts uh, insider readership that gets shared around amongst opinion leaders. That you kind of for, you right. kind of forget you kind of forget to check an individual site sometimes, um, and well, I also think psycho- psychologically. I mean, if you're writing, if your blog is hosted at a larger site, you still feel like you're part of a team. I mean, oh, I didn't write today, but Jim Treacher wrote, uh, and Jim Mantle wrote a good column today. So it's not like the Daily Caller readers are being deprived of mm-hmm. fresh stuff. I you know I, I sort of. Didn't have a great day, but other people stepped up. Well, um, but I mean, just, you you, know, you have a, you have a pretty strong Twitter following, and you share articles by your Daily Caller authors. You know, and 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 you're not alone. That you know, the, the BuzzFeed authors share each other stuff all the time. Political people share each other stuff all the time. You got a team. You got a team of people backing you. Uh, and I I bet that if Sullivan felt like his blogging was having more of a daily impact on things that that mitigates against the burnout because your 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 ego is getting fed on a daily basis in a way that's not when you're kind of your own island um and that and that's a, and that's a motivating factor uh so uh, it, it is a lot of work it is a lot of energy a lot of mental energy to expend and so if you feel like you're shouting into the wind that burnout's gonna gonna catch up right. on you a lot a lot faster. Well, let me ask you, Bill, because you're a blogger, and you and I used to do this show. Used to be called uh, the Weekend Blog. I right. mean, that's how we started off. Was talking about what was happening in the blogosphere this week. Um, you've evolved as a writer. I mean, you're probably less a blogger than you used to be. I'm probably less a blogger than I used to be. But how have you? Um, managed to stay in this game and not quit how have you and i'm not saying i mean sullivan's not going to leave the world of opinion leader status i mean but how have you been able to endure and keep on keeping on well one I, i've always struggled with the pace of it I, I i never was someone who wrote more than one blog post a day uh and that and that and that held me back uh, in this universe, you know, people like, you know, in the early days, Atrios and, and, and Coes, those folks built their audiences up because they were doing 12 posts a day. And I, I, I felt I didn't, I didn't have 12 of interesting, interesting things to say in a given day to warrant that. Right. I would cut out. So my early blogging was always a column a day. I kind of sat back and watched up the early day and I kind of, and I, and I said to myself, okay, what can I say that hasn't been said today? And I would say that, that one thing, and that was it. And, and that pace, you know, it, it, 
built a nice little following, but it wasn't enough to build a, an empire. Uh, and what, uh, so as, as I've sort of came aware of my limitations in that score, I had to say, okay, what, what am I capable of doing that fits the world that I'm, that I'm living in? Uh, partly it's been forcing myself to change, you know, I, I with the onset of Twitter, I've tried to tweet more, but even that I have difficulty uh, doing that at the pace I think that is required to build a good following. Uh, and I'm more constrained now than I used to be because I have two kids and I uh, work out of the house. Uh, but I also said, what can I do that doesn't require that that pace? And I started to do more long form freelance writing with with Politico, with Real Clear Politics, uh, with The Week magazine. Uh, and to to and to, to get that kind of perch that says, OK, I I I. Uh, I can get paid for doing things that don't require uh, uh, that frantic output uh, and, and, and fits what strengths I have. That's helped me to, uh, to persevere. Yeah, I think it's a game of adjustments and you have to uh, stay true to yourself, but also kind of be reinventing and, and adapting as, as you go to stay relevant. It's not easy. Uh, it's, it's not easy to do. I think people, um, people probably think it is, but what's your, what's your Thursday show going to be? Um, Henry Kissinger said that when you go into sort of high government service, public office or whatever, you are living off of borrowed intellectual capital. You're, you're not, you're not going to learn anything new. And I think there's a danger that that happens to writers and bloggers, especially if you're chasing field mice all the time. Um, that you're essentially living off of borrowed intellectual capital. And I think that the real way to uh, have a long-term success is to have that balance where you're, repl- you're depleting, but you're also replenishing your, your soul and your uh, intellect. And um, that is a struggle that I, I suspect, you know, you can't really bitch about getting paid to write, but I suspect people who haven't done that don't, don't appreciate 15 years. Andrew Sullivan's been doing it for 15 years that he's in, you know, say, say what you will about him. Some things that he's done and said, I'm not fans of, but he's in Cooperstown. If he's in, he's, he's on the, the blogger Mount Rushmore. I mean, there's no doubt about that. Uh, well, let's talk about one more thing before, before I have to, before I have to jump. And uh, you had, uh, wrote a piece for the Telegraph about the, Controversy surrounding American Sniper, a movie which I've not seen, so I'm somewhat handicapped in talking about it. Uh, but uh, but you actually interviewed uh, the the late protagonist Chris Kyle on your podcast uh, when when his when his memoir came out. So you have you know that level of insight in, in, uh, into him. Uh, I, I I was sort of struck in this uh, as this controversy around uh, you know what the movie was trying to say and if. Uh, if Kyle was, is sort of an honest teller of his own story and all that kind of stuff. Uh, you know, th- there's obviously a, a, a healthy degree of journalism that goes into uh, fact checking anything, whether it's a movie or a book or, or whatnot. But I, I personally kind of question the, the intensity around it. Cause there, there seemed to be a sense in the left that sort of this movie was going to color people's, view of the Iraq war and make it seem more honor to make the war itself more honorable than it was. And I was kind of like, everybody hates this war. <laughs> no, no, there's no one saying this was a good war to do. Uh, I don't think anyone on the left or right says this at this point. I, I, I can't see any movie. Uh, so like saying this, that you know, George Bush was right. And uh, this all worked out in the end. I, 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 I can't see any movie uh, uh, pulling off that stunt. So uh, well, no, I, but but nor but nor do I think that they're attempting to. Right. I mean, they, and that, that, that's and that's why you know to me the most offended. You know, Michael Moore calling him a coward. That just shows he didn't see the movie because if you or read the book because it's not like Chris Kyle was just a sniper hidden away. Well, he says he saw the movie. I mean, he, he he gave a fairly thorough review of the movie. I mean, uh, uh, well, I think he, because the notion that you know. I think the premise of that Michael Moore was making is that snipers are people who are like safe a mile away, safe and just picking off people. But Chris Kyle was in harm's way on multiple occasions and two of his comrades were shot and killed. I mean, alongside him. So 
the coward thing is is utterly ridiculous. But the but the thing that the piece that really bothered me the most, I think, was Matt Taibbi's piece, and uh, for two reasons. One, I think um, the 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 suggestion. Okay, first of all, this this is a story about Chris Kyle, um, and, and I think that the uh, the foisting of a larger template to suggest that this is about the Iraq War and not about the story of Chris Kyle, I think is is problematic and and wrongheaded. But but I also think that to suggest that this is a pro war movie is is also misguided. I mean. There are a lot of things that that this movie shows. I mean, for example, Kyle, um, you know, there's there's uh, you know PTSD. There, are, this this demonstrates the the toll that that war takes on on the family, on home life. Um, there there were there were a lot of things that would lead you know there are a lot of things that would lead you to believe that war is a horrible thing. Um, that he wrestles with ethical questions over when, over shooting people. So the idea that this is some jingoistic, uh, you know, movie that, that that's yeah, I think that's I think that's bad. Now look, now what, it, now does, one, one it does I... show. Well, I was going to say real quick, it does show things like who the bad guys were, and that that there were some horrible you know terrorists and and horrible things happening and horrible people. In Iraq, but to but to suppose that this makes like a larger geopolitical argument, and that it uh, somehow says that the Iraq War was a good thing, uh, is is bogus. If you see the movie, Clint Eastwood is anti-war. I mean, last time I checked, I didn't think Bradley Cooper is some sort of you know right winger. So I don't know. I think the criticism was was uh, was unfair. Now, one of the criticisms I've seen uh, is that that the film. Uh, you know, has this kind of good guy, bad guy uh, frame to it where where the Iraqis are essentially dehumanized. They're all just they're all just bad guys that Chris Kyle shoots uh, and that takes away from a lot of the complexities of the war. And so my my gut reaction to that is, uh, well, if this is I mean, this if this film is not intending to be a document documentary of the entire war well of course it's going to have a limited perspective because a movie can only accomplish so many perspectives without being a jumbled mess it has to a movie a, a fictional movie it's not it's not a non-fiction movie it's a fictional movie even though it might be based in in, in, a, in a memoir uh it's going to have a narrative it's going to have a good guy it's going to have a bad guy protagonist and, and and so forth uh and it's you can't ask it to do more than what it's it's trying to do. It it may be sort of bad for society writ large that we don't have more three dimensional portrayals of non Americans in war movies. Um, but is that fair to put that desire on this one movie when they're trying to tell a different kind of story? Uh, but I can, I haven't seen it, so uh, yeah, I, yeah. Well, but even that, I know you haven't seen it, and but I would say having seen it, that also falls apart because. There is like, for example, there's a, you know, one of the jobs that, that, uh, that the Marines are doing is going house to house in Fallujah and trying to find, you know, Al Qaeda in Iraq. And there's a scene where Kyle actually joins the Marines doing this and he gets a good, a good Iraqi family who is afraid of the bad guys and and this family spoiler alert by the way if you haven't seen the movie this is a spoiler alert not saying it's the most important scene in the movie but (laughs) spoiler alert um this family actually tells kyle information like how to track down some of the bad guys and then this family is like brutally murdered by the bad guys because they were trying to cooperate with the americans so that is showing that there are that there were people who weren't that there were people there who were not terrorists who were not bad inherently bad. Uh, so I don't know. I, I think that the criticism was really simple. I will say this: I think the the one criticism that doesn't get brought up much, probably because it's not in the movie and it's not in the book, but it's something that happened. Uh, 
that, that I talked to Chris Kyle about when I interviewed him was he claims that um, he claimed that he uh, that he punched out Jesse the Body Ventura at a bar. Right. And, and, and Ventura, Ventura's won his lawsuit about that, right? Yes. And and after Kyle, you know, Kyle died, he was he was killed by a, uh, a Marine he was trying to help who had PTSD. Um, and Ventura won a libel suit against a dead man, which I suspect is difficult to do. Um, Kyle came on my radio, my podcast and, and said that he had witnesses who were going to be coming out supporting his claim. As far as I know, those, those witnesses never materialized. So that, that I think is great, raises some questions about, uh, you know, about his truthfulness or, you know, look, maybe somebody looked like Jesse Ventura. I, I don't know. I can't say, but to me, that's a sort of a fair question to ask about Chris Kyle. Um, but in terms of the stuff in the movie, I, I was really, um, I don't see how you can go see that movie and walk out. And your first instinct is to write a think piece attacking Chris Kyle and that movie. Like, I, I don't know what to compare it to, but I can't imagine being the kind of person that would do that. Like, it, 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 <clears throat> I, I don't know. It, it, it would be like going hunting after seeing Bambi. Like, you walk out of Bambi and the first, you know, and you, like, literally go hunting immediately. Like, I, I, you know, it, 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 it takes a special, it takes a special kind of person to be able to, um, to see what, to see that movie and to see what I would call heroism um, and to go write a piece like that. Uh, one last question before we have to go. Uh, I assume you've seen other Clint Eastwood uh, films about war and then they're, they're, most of the films he's done about war, I think have been pretty lauded, have been considered to be uh, sophisticated and nuanced. And, and, you know, he, he's, he's talked, he's, he's talked about war from the American side, from the Japanese side. He's talked about the complexities of, of, of wild West violence. Um, how could a guy like that have done his speech at the 22 Republican convention? How do you square those two things? That to me is still one of those things. I every time I go back and I, I can't believe that happened. I can't believe that was a real thing that I was alive to have witnessed that some, that adults allowed to go forward. Can, can you can you make sense of that? Well, I mean, to me, they're not related. Like, on one hand, you have a guy who gave a ridiculous speech at the convention where he talked to a chair, and it was just a bizarre speech. On the other hand, you have a guy who's a Republican who's also anti-war. And to me, that's not inconsistent at all. Um, you know, look at Rand Paul. And so I, I think that, like, again, he gave a bizarre speech at the convention where he talked to a chair. And that's weird in and of itself. But the fact that he's a guy who is a Republican, who's also anti-war, who's also nuanced and complex, should not surprise us. I know it does, but should not surprise us. Well, we'll leave it on that note. Uh, I uh, I hope you have an enjoyable Super Bowl Sunday. I hope it meets expectations. I hope it is uh, uh, free of cheating, and uh, we can we we can regroup and uh, discuss next week. All right. Well, listen. I'm going to predict uh, the, the Pats win, though. I'm going to say that because because I, they're cheaters. Yeah, I think that you know cheaters usually prosper. <laughs> um, so I, I think that the Pats will win. That's my prediction. But Bill. Who do you think is going to win? Um, as I as I I, I want to uh, predict on the side of justice, as I always want to do. So I'm going to the Seahawks win, and uh, okay. uh, honesty will triumph over deceit. We don't know how honest they are either, but but I but I am proud. You know, uh, you know Russell Wilson seems like he may he's either he's either a really pretentious, pious sanctimonious guy or he's a really great guy who's like a true believer and, and i hope it's the latter so uh so maybe you know maybe something good will come out of it we'll see you're you're a hopeful man
Indeed. All right. Until next time, uh, good talking to you, Bill, and we'll see everyone back here in the DMZ next week. Take care.